Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with a lecture for Anatomy and Physiology 1 at Madison Area Technical College. In this lecture, I will talk about the anatomy of the brain, just an overview. And then the second part, I'll talk about the cerebral spinal fluid that protects the brain on the outside and on the inside of the brain. And finally, the blood-brain barrier, which is a structure that protects brain tissue from any harmful substances that might be present in the blood. Now the average adult brain weighs about three pounds and is the size of two of your fists. It forms from a hollow tube called the neural tube which develops by embryonic week four. And I've circled it on the left. That's the neural tube. As the brain develops, it continues and folds, it continues to elongate and thicken, and it folds and forms some outpocketings or swellings. So you can see some swellings here on the outside of the neural tube. These swellings give rise to the four main regions of the brain that are present at birth. The four main regions are the cerebrum, colored beige, that's the first part of the neural tube, and you can see how it enlarges. The diencephalon, which is colored purple, it's the second part of the neural tube, and due to folding, moves to the interior of the brain. The third region is the brain stem, colored green. And the fourth region is the cerebellum, which is colored salmon, orange, pinkish, right, the cerebellum. And it enlarges over time. Now the brain is protected by the skull, of course and we've learned different bones in the skull. But in addition, underneath the skull are three membranes called meninges. There's also cerebral spinal fluid between two of these meninges located in the subarachnoid space. So let's name the meninges. The three meninges from superficial to deep are the dura matter, which is actually composed of two layers, Then this kind of transparent layer, which is the arachnoid matter. And then the pia matter, which adheres very tightly to the brain. So the subarachnoid space is in between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. And CSF is located there. So the subarachnoid space has spider-like extensions that secure the arachnoid matter to the pia matter. And the CSF that's located in this region cushions the brain. It gives it some buoyancy, almost as if it's floating in the skull, and thereby decreasing its weight. Also notice that the dura matter dips in between the two cerebral hemispheres. So the dura matter located, the pink layer anyway of the dura matter, dips down in between the two cerebral hemispheres. So this is an anterior view and this would be the right side of the brain, the right cerebrum, and this would be the left. And at the midline, we have um, a membrane separating those two um, cerebral lobes and or hemispheres, and that's dura matter. So the dura matter has these partitions, I guess we would call them. They're technically called septa, and the one that we were just looking at in between the two cerebral hemispheres is called the falx cerebri. So it's right in the midline. 
the specific name of this other one, the Tentorium cerebelli, extends from kind of dorsal to ventral or posterior to anterior and running horizontally. And it lies between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. Another structure related to the meninges, specifically the dura mater, are the dural venous sinuses. These are large veins and um, they're located between the two layers of the dura mater. These veins collect blood that's deoxygenated. So the blood is dr being drained from the brain and it'll travel in the internal jugular veins to the heart and then to the lungs to be reoxygenated. So we have already seen that cerebral spinal fluid, commonly known as CSF, is located in the subarachnoid space that surrounds the outside of the brain, right? But CSF is also located within the interior of the brain inside four spaces that are called ventricles. These ventricles develop from the hollow cavity of that embryonic neural tube. The hollow chambers, the ventricles, are continuous with one another and they are connected to the outer subarachnoid space so that CSF flows in a specific pattern within the ventricles to the subarachnoid space. Let's just look at the ventricular system to begin with before we discuss the flow of CSF. The ventricular system includes two ventricles deep, one in each cerebral hemisphere, and each of them are called a lateral ventricle. So there's one left lateral ventricle and one right lateral ventricle. They're C-shaped, which you can see in a lateral view. But anteriorly, there's a region where they lie very close to one another. Right there, I put a square around it. In this region, they're separated by a thin membrane called the septum pellucidum. And if you were to cut the brain in half down the mid-sagittal line, you would probably destroy this septum pellucidum. If you cut off to the side just a little bit, that's too far, you would see the septum pellucidum. And we'll try to do that when we dissect our sheep brain. Both of these lateral ventricles connect to the third ventricle. And the third ventricle is narrow and it lies at the midline between two halves of a structure known as the thalamus. So on either side of this third ventricle, there will be thalamus tissue. Now the thalamus tissue is a continuous left and right. So there's this mass of tissue that crosses the third ventricle, this space between the two halves of the thalamus. And that's why you see a hole here right there. <clears throat> so the third ventricle is connected to the fourth ventricle by a canal called the cerebral aqueduct. So the cerebral aqueduct is a narrow passageway right here. And in the fourth ventricle, space widens a little bit. The fourth ventricle lies dorsal to the pons and the medulla. Here it looks like it's very anterior, you know, because we're not seeing tissue in front of it. But if you look at the lateral view, you see that that fourth ventricle right here is actually quite dorsal or posterior. So the uh, fourth ventricle 
has three openings into the subarachnoid space. And these openings are called apertures. There's two of them that are called lateral apertures, which can be seen on the anterior view right here and right here. And um, there's also one median or medial aperture. CSF, therefore, can flow from this fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space. So, as I mentioned before, the cerebral spinal fluid is located in the subarachnoid space and the ventricles deep in the brain. But in addition, cerebral spinal fluid is found in the interior of the spinal cord. There's a canal that forms from the original embryonic neural tube called the central canal. So that's right here. And so CSF is also located around your spinal cord and deep inside your spinal cord. The functions that I've already mentioned include, you know, suspending the brain, giving it buoyancy, protecting it from impact injuries. But in addition, because the CSF has a very specific ion uh, constitution, it regulates the chemical environment that the brain experiences and the spinal cord. It's produced by structures called the choroid plexus. And these choroid plexi, I guess, are located in the ventricles. And they look like red blood vessels here or capillaries. They're located in the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle. And so those are the structures that produce the cerebral spinal fluid. And they do so continuously all day long. So that about 500 milliliters per day is produced. Yet, the ventricles and the subarachnoid space can only hold 100 to 160 milliliters of CSF. So, as CSF is continually produced, it also has to be continuously removed. And removal occurs when the cerebral spinal fluid is reabsorbed into the bloodstream at the dural venal sinus venous sinuses. So we're going to look next at the flow of CSF all the way from formation to reabsorption. So because of the continuous production in the ventricles by the choroid plexus, CSF flows in a very specific pattern or pathway from superior to inferior within the brain. So within the brain, the CSF is going to flow from superior to inferior. But on the outside of the brain, in the subarachnoid sp space, it flows from inferior to superior. And then finally, it is reabsorbed into the brain uh, I'm sorry, into the blood, which is what this big blue structure is on the outside of the brain that you see. That's a vein, one of the dural venous sinuses. So once the CSF has been produced in a ventricle, the cerebral spinal fluid then flows inferiorly. So if we start up in a lateral ventricle, the CSF will flow to the third ventricle. And of course, more CSF is made by this choroid plexus. So that will be added to the total volume. Then CSF flows through the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle, where more CSF is added to the volume. Now, once CSF has reached the fourth ventricle, it leaves the fourth ventricle through those holes or apertures 
and this picture shows the apertures labeled number six lateral and median you don't have to know which is which just that they exist so this little aperture right there allows CSF to exit the interior ventricular system and get to the exterior subarachnoid space as more and more CSF is produced, a force is generated, causing the CSF to move superiorly, where there's more openings to the dural venous sinuses. So now CSF is going to move within the subarachnoid space, and it looks for, or it finds, I don't know that it really looks for it, but it finds these openings into the vein and these openings are called granulations we call them arachnoid granulations so the CSF has been between the pia matter and the subarachnoid matter or the arachnoid matter and now it's going to puncture the um, arachnoid matter and get into kind of a, a dural space and when it does so it it encounters blood venous blood and eventually it will return to the heart proceed to the lungs be oxygenated and then pumped back to the heart into the arteries by the heart into the arteries now one of the um, disorders we find with the brain is impaired flow of cerebral spinal fluid now that can cause something called hydrocephalus which means water on the brain usually this is a problem with um, the flow of CSF particularly at the cerebral aqueduct but some other things might include a blockage in one of the arachnoid granulations so that reabsorption can't happen. This blockage could be a tumor. It could be due to infection, some sort of hemorrhage, and then a clot. Or more commonly, it's a congenital malformation at birth so that the cerebral aqueduct is really super narrow and CSF accumulates on the inside of the brain. This is discovered shortly after birth because the bones of the skull in a baby haven't completely um, ossified together yet, so they're still malleable. And so the brain enlarges due to the ventricular enlargement and the skull bones shift accommodating this extra size so the head becomes really big that's very noticeable and so they go in and repair the cerebral aqueduct surgically by putting a shunt in there now let's talk about how the CSF is produced okay We know that CSF is produced by the choroid plexus, and yet we don't really know what the choroid plexus is. So let's talk about that. Basically, it's made up of blood capillaries. So the choroid plexus has capillaries, shown in red here and labeled capillary. And it is these capillaries are surrounded by specialized epithelial cells called ependymal cells. This entire structure is sitting inside a ventricle, kind of like a polyp in the ventricle. Now the capillaries have slits called fenestrations, and you can't really see the slits very well in this picture, but um, they occur in the cells and between the cells so they're called fenestrated capillaries you can't really see that 
with their slits. The ependymal cells are connected to each other with tight junctions. So what that means is that material cannot pass in between cells. Anything that's going to get into the ventricular space, which lies out here, has to cross the ependymal cell. Anything that's going to come in or leave, actually, has to cross the, cyto the membrane, the cytoplasm, and the membrane of an ependymal cell. So the way that CSF is produced is classified as a type of filtration. And that is that there's some force with which the blood arrives in the capillary. Do, you know, we know what blood pressure is. So in the capillaries, blood pressure is low, but it's still there. That makes plasma leak out of the capillary through fenestrations. So plasma exits. Red blood cells stay inside the capillary, as do white blood cells, and platelets for that matter. <clears throat> now, not all of the plasma contents can cross the ependymal cells because of the presence of the tight junctions primarily. The ependymal cells will regulate what will actually cross them and get into this ventricular space. To, so to um, illustrate that fact, I just drew in little membrane channels or pumps in green and orange. So on this membrane, there's a certain pump, and over here, there's a certain pump. So water can cross freely through those aquaporins, so water goes out of the plasma or whatever, across the cells and into the ventricular, into the ventricle. No proteins at all will get into the ventricle. Those proteins can't go across the membrane. Instead, they'll go back into the bloodstream. And ions, some ions are particularly important, as you can imagine, Potassium, sodium, uh, doesn't write well enough. Potassium, sodium, chloride, magnesium, all the big ones, they have to be pumped into the ventricle. So due to the selective nature of the choroid plexus, and in particular the ependymal cells, the composition of cerebral spinal fluid is very similar to plasma, blood plasma, but it has different ion concentrations and less protein, actually hardly any protein. So what tends to get out of the plasma and get into the ventricle are some important things like glucose, which is an energy source, oxygen needed to make ATP by cells, some vitamins, and some ions. Now, at the same time, the brain tissue has created some waste products like CO2 or anything else that's unnecessary. Those materials will have to be transported into the blood. And to do that, they'll have to cross the ependymal cells as well. So in talking about how CSF is made by <coughs> the um, choroid plexus, we've really talked about something known as the blood CSF barrier. And that is that CSF originates from the blood and then it's reabsorbed back into the blood. But not everything that's in the blood should get into the CSF. And so the, this barrier that they refer to regulates the movement of substances from the blood into the cerebral spinal fluid. And primarily, it's made up of, anatomically, the tight junctions between the ependymal cells. There's another kind of barrier that protects the brain, 
And now we're talking about protecting brain tissue um, from anything that's in the blood. So these, this, these structures that I'm going to talk about, the blood-brain barrier structures, regulate movement of substances from the blood to brain tissue, not CSF. So they involve, these structures, the blood-brain barrier, involve capillaries that aren't part of the choroid plexus. Because you have blood vessels all over the outside of your brain and delving deep into your brain. Those blood vessels aren't all making CSF, but they are supplying nutrient-rich oxygenated blood to blood tissue. These capillaries also have tight junctions between them to prevent substances from leaking out of the blood. So let's just take a quick look at um, the blood vessels, not in a lot of detail, but somewhat, the blood vessels that supply oxygenated blood to the brain, so the arterial blood supply. From the heart, which is down here, here's my heart, pretty lopsided heart, blood leaves the aorta, travels in the carotid artery, as well as in the vertebral artery to get deep into the internal carotid artery and supplies all different parts of the brain. Okay, and this is happening both on the right side and the left side. One thing you might remember about skeletal anatomy is that the cervical vertebrae had extra um, holes called transverse foramina on the side of the body of the vertebrae, right? So here's the body of a cervical vertebrae, and then there was a transverse process that came out, right? These holes are what the vertebral arteries are traveling through to get up to the brain. So, <clears throat> The paired internal carotid arteries and paired vertebral arteries branch quite extensively once they get inside the skull. At the base of the brain, there are branches that communicate with one another of these arteries and form a circular structure or connection called the circle of Willis. This is really important because it allows for the blockage of blood in one location to not be completely detrimental. So if there was a blockage where I drew this line, this brain tissue wouldn't receive oxygenated blood if there wasn't this circle of Willis. So because of the circle of Willis, Blood can come from another location. Anytime you have this kind of a communication where two blood vessels supply a certain region, we call it an anastomosis. And the advantage is to provide collateral circulation to brain tissue, ensuring that regions of the brain are supplied by more than one main artery. So these are the capillaries that I'm talking about forming the blood-brain barrier. On the outside of the brain, you have lots of capillaries. Also, we saw at the base and deeper. And there's going to be tight junctions located between the cells that make up the wall of those capillaries. If we look at one of those capillaries, the wall of the capillaries, we see that there's more than just tight junctions preventing substances from leaking out of the blood. So really the blood-brain barrier is composed of three different things. One would be those tight junctions between the capillary cells or the epithelial cells. In addition, <clears throat> the capillaries are surrounded by a type of a connective tissue. It's pretty thin, though. 
It's called the basement membrane. And on top of that, there are astrocytes in the brain tissue that send out extensions called foot processes, and they surround the basement membrane. So astrocyte foot processes. For anything to make its way out of the blood and into the brain tissue, it's going to have to cross the tight junctions of the capillary wall or go through the epithelial cell, cross the basement membrane, and cross those astrocyte foot processes. Now, what gets through? Water. Clearly, that's going to be important glucose, iron, oxygen, carbon dioxide. Those are all good things, right? But some other things get through, like alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, some anesthetics, right? So when they design anesthetics, they make sure for surgery, right? They make sure that... Um, the, the pharmaceutical can leave the blood and get to the brain tissue. Lithium, that's used for treatment of manic depression. And another drug called L-DOPA, used for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So whatever that blood-brain barrier is permeable to is going to depend on what kind of transporters are present in those epithelial cells. In fact, some treatments take advantage of certain transporters and kind of uh, piggyback on whatever is being crossed or whatever is crossing into the brain and um, that way gain access to the brain tissue. The bad thing about the blood-brain barrier is that um, it's impermeable to some antibiotics and other drugs that might be needed okay, to tr for treatment. So it can really complicate the treatment of neurological diseases. So this is just a summary of what the blood-brain barrier is composed of, why it's needed, and advantages and disadvantages. So just to review, the blood-brain barrier is, think of the capillaries on the outside of the brain. It, the, the barrier regulates and maintains a stable environment for brain tissue. We don't want variations because that could cause dysfunction. The components of the blood-brain barrier are tight junctions between those cells of the capillary wall the basement membrane, and the astrocyte foot processes. It's advantageous because it prevents the spread of anything infectious or harmful from getting to the brain from the blood. The bad thing is, in some cases, it can prevent certain medicines from reaching brain tissue. So that's all for the blood-brain barrier CSF. Thank you very much.